pretty pat to me, Al. You're looking for a nervous safecracker. I think there's more to it than that. It's the seventh job in the past year with the same M.O. A lot of punchers in New York. Could easily be a different character pulling each one. Take a look at the names. Cartwright, Stevenson. See where they live? They're all Park Avenue. Being rich has a lot of hazards. Rich and alone, probably. They're widows, and the lights aren't out for a couple of them. But what are we looking for? I don't know. But on every job, the victim was out to a party. Including the last one? She was at the home of Quincy Desmond, another rich one, lover of the arts. It's too bad she got bored. Who? The victim. The party was dull, so she left early. Then all her boredom ended. <laughs> Step number one. On the 23rd of November, year unspecified, Special Investigator Shannon left his apartment to visit one of his former clients, Mildred Sableton. She lived on Park Avenue. here in the high rent district. Not looking for your little dog again, that's for sure. Oh, now don't get highfalutin with me. I can remember the day when sniffing out a poodle was the only job you could find. <laughs> Where is he? He's at the beauty shop. He goes every Wednesday. You want a little drink? Sure. Well, sit down and take a load off your feet. Did you know Jane Kohler? Yeah. What a shame. How could anyone want to shoot a harmless old lady like Jane? I hear she was at Quincy Desmond's that evening. Well, you hear right. There's a group of them go up and live it up at Quincy's a couple of nights a week. You mean you're not one of them? Me? Oh, now, Shannon, come on. You know me better than that. A bunch of old ladies sitting around trying to act like they're still in their prime. <laughs> when a blind man can see it isn't so. How hard is it to get on Desmond's guest list? Well, now, that all depends. You either have to be in the social register or young. That qualifies me. Yeah, I guess it does. You know, if I were 20 years younger... In fact, we'll look like a real gigolo couple when we walk in together. <laughs> I laugh not at another's loss. I grudge not at another's gain. No worldly waves my mind can toss. My state at one doth remain. I fear no foe, I fawn no friend. I loathe not life, nor dread my end. That was very good, Quincy. Very good. Only don't be afraid to go slow. Take your time and enunciate carefully. Oh, and project yourself a little more like this. I loathe not life nor dread my end. I'll never be able to read in front of the group. Yes, you will. Have patience. Oh, you've done wonders for me, Ronnie. What have I done? You've made me feel that I'm not an old woman. Now, Quincy, it doesn't take me to tell you that. Oh, what a terrible void there was in my life until you came along. You're a remarkable young man, Ronnie. All right, I'll drink to that. Uh, you seem to be in good spirits, Gerald. I always am at Quincy's. Everything here is so removed from the normal world. Am I so abnormal? For me, yes. You have dinner with me tonight, Daisy? This affair might last a while. Oh, just some drinks and poetry reading. The night will still be young. Where do you get your energy, Gerald? I'll be exhausted by the time Ronnie finishes his readings. Who's that? Oh, Mildred Savillan. I wonder what she's doing here. She's a character first class. Nice looking man she's with. Don't know him, but Mildred might see her with anybody. 
I expected anyone but you. <laughs> Ronnie, Mildred Stapleton's the first rebel of New York. Oh, I'll try anything once, as long as it isn't mild. Oh, you'll <laughs> never change, not in 30 years. Oh, please, let's not bring up a sore subject. Sore? Oh, oh, it's just that Ronnie makes me forget such trivial things as age. Oh, well, I can't forget. When I look at laughing eyes over here, I wince with jealousy. <laughs> you'll have to employ more charm, Mr. Masters. I'll try. <laughs> Oh, what are you reading this evening, Rosie? I'm not quite sure yet. You know, it really depends on the mood of the guests. Uh -uh. <laughs> Hello, Gerald. Daisy. When does the reading begin? Any minute now. Just as soon as the folks get settled. Glad you dropped by, Ronnie. Maybe you can induce your sister to have dinner with me. You never get a chance to talk to her except in a crowded room. She's been that way ever since she was six years old, Gerald. It means she really cares. Well, glad to hear that. Now she just let me know. Everyone needs some encouragement, Daisy. You don't give up, do you? Never. I like that. Don't listen to my brother for advice. We'll have to have a man-to-man -man talk, Ronnie. Yes, and very soon, Gerald. It's about time my little sister got settled down. Well, Jill? I think so. I'll get you a wrap. Nice turnout, isn't it, Ronnie? Yes, it is. You will be sitting in your usual place when the reading begins, huh? Why, naturally. Where have you been for the last few days? Looking after the old lady. And enjoying it. See you later, sis. <laughs> oh, it's, it's all been so wonderful. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, are you ready, dear? Uh, yes. Excuse me. <laughs> uh, attention, everybody. Attention, I, I think we can begin the reading now. Baroness von Hunsick has arrived. This is her first visit with us, and uh, Mr. Lane's reading will be dedicated to her. <laughs> Ballad of Reading Jail by Oscar Wilde. He did not wear his scarlet coat, for blood and wine are red, and blood and wine were on his hands when they found him with the dead, the poor dead woman whom he loved and murdered in her bed. He walked amongst the trial men. His suit was shabby gray. A cricket cap was on his head. And his step seemed light and gay. But I never saw a man who looked so wistfully at the day. And now, my dear ones, I would like to do a number I wish I would have written entitled Swingin' Through Africa. Repeat of the last one. How long's the reading? All right. But make sure she stays there two hours. Okay. In Reading Jail by Reading Town, there is a pit of shame. And in it lies a wretched man, eaten by teeth of flame. In a burning, winding sheet he lies. His grave has got no name. And there till Christ call forth the dead, in silence let him lie. No need to waste the foolish tear or heave the windy sigh. 
for the man has killed the thing he loved. And so he had to die. And all men kill the thing they love. By all, let this be heard. Some do it with a bitter look. Some with a flattering word. The coward does it with a kiss. The brave man with a sword. Why not? Well, the taste of poetry is about to perish. Quince, it sure has a lot of young people around. Well, you can't blame her, Shannon. She's still young herself in many ways. Doesn't take a genius to figure out who she's interested in, either. Lane? What do you think? I think you're right. But to each his own, if you're not with it, don't knock it. Did I knock it? Who is it you're interested in, private eyes? I thought you weren't going to ask any more questions. After three drinks, who keeps promises? Hello? What? Again? Well, why are you telling me? Well, did she report it? Well, that's all she can do. <laughs> Goodbye. Something wrong? That was Quincet. Baroness von Hunsick's apartment was burglarized tonight. What'd she lose? About $10,000 worth of jewelry. You know, it's all very odd. Odd? She's the fourth or fifth friend of Quincet's who's been robbed this year. <laughs> Ideas? A few. The burglary took place around 8.30, right in the middle of Oscar Wilde. What? Oscar Wilde. A fellow named Ronnie Lane was reading his poetry. Oh. Who's Lane? I don't know yet, except he's playing gigolo for Quincy Desmond. Did anybody leave the apartment during the reading? No. Then maybe you're on the wrong track. Somebody had to pull the job. And somebody might have played tipster. The names of everyone at Desmond's. How'd you work this? If I told you, you'd know as much about my job as I do. Find out if Daisy Lane is Ronnie's sister. Is she good looking? If you saw her, that'd be an insult. You'd think I was his sister the way he drops by now and then. That's show business. He'll be here, he'll be here. Who asked you? Look, don't get riled at me. I didn't write the music. You want fancy clothes on your back, so what choice does he have? There's simpler ways than this. Not as long as you and Ronnie share the same pad. It's called marriage clipper. It'll change. Relax. Better. Or Gerald Donaldson's going to have the smile of his life. Who's he? A gray-haired rectangle with money coming out of his mouth. Ronnie wouldn't mind. That's just it. Clipper? Daisy? What to tell him? Tell him what? That I feel like a widow. Baby, that's show business. <laughs> I'm not kidding, Ronnie. What do you want me to do? Tell Quince that I've had it and just walk away? That it'd suit me fine. Sure, sure. Then the whole deal goes right out of the window. Maybe you're enjoying your work. After all, she's not an unattractive old lady. Now, Daisy, dearest, you're a little too young to get jealous. Take a good look at my eyes and repeat that. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe we ought to change the tune, huh? Yeah, that's a good idea, Clipper. Hey, look, Clipper, tomorrow night there's going to be another reading. Now, that'll be your chance to case Gerald's apartment. Donaldson? Any complaints? Brother, you don't miss a bet, do you? I just said case it. We may never really hit him. That's not what I mean. Robbing Donaldson is a good way to stop something before little Daisy thinks about beginning. I thought we were going to change the subject. Yeah, I, uh, I got a date with a drum. You're better off. Every time I'm with a girl, I want to kill him. Such an ideal person to have around the house. 
Look, I've got an idea. What? Let's call off the war between us, huh? Shannon was again invited to the Desmond apartment. He was told by the district attorney's office that Ronnie and Daisy Lane were not brother and sister. They were husband and wife. I want to congratulate you, Mr. Masters. What have I done? Well, someone's responsible for Mildred's newly acquired love. Oh, she's referring to the poetry. Usually I don't dig it. <laughs> you keep up the good influence. <laughs> Come on, Daisy. I think we need a little drink. Yes, go right in and help yourselves. Do you need anything, dear? No. But do you ever get strange feelings? Like what? Like I wish everyone would vanish and we could be alone. I'll make it a short poem tonight. Thank you. Gerald, would you please excuse me? I'll be right back. Okay. Nice night, isn't it, Miss Lane? I don't think I know your name. Phil Masters. Now we're old friends. Good. What poem is your brother reading tonight? I have no idea. You don't look like the type interested in poetry. Nor do you. But I am. Not Oscar Wilde, but Dunn, Blake, metaphysical poets. Hello, Mr. Masters. Daisy, getting a little fresh air? You might call it that. But what Daisy and you both need is a fresh approach. I beg your pardon? The penny ante heist you're pulling when there's a fortune under your nose. Ronnie, what is this man talking about? Hitting that Von Hunzig dame for 10 Gs. Keep knocking the small stuff over, and sooner or later, they'll be taking you out of these readings in handcuffs. Have you had too much to drink, Mr. Masters? Maybe we better talk about it later. And the third member of your group is around. Ronnie, everyone's waiting, dear. Yes, dear, coming. Will you come in, Daisy? In a moment, darling. All right, it's unanimous. One big job is better than 20 small ones. Since there's four of us, it'll have to be at least 100 grand. 100 grand? Whew, the price even scares me. And I know exactly who it is we're going to hit. Who? Quincet Desmond. Daisy, why don't you lie down and take a why? rest? Look, Daisy. What makes her so untouchable? Will you calm down a minute? Desmond happens to be the key to the whole operation. She also has 100 G's worth of jewelry in her bedroom. I know. So while I'm reading poetry, Clipper here knocks on the door. When the butler answers, he says, excuse me, I'm here to punch Mrs. Desmond's safe, huh? Not at all. There's a servant's entrance. Make sure your reading begins at 8 o'clock on the button. At 8.10, I quietly move out of the living room and unlock the door for Clipper. While you're reading, he works. Nah, that's not for me. I get too nervous with all those people in the next room. It's interesting, imaginative, and lucrative, but it won't Wait a work. minute, Ronnie. You've been coaching Quincet as a reader, right? Yeah. And why not read a short poem? When I come back in the living room, and you know Clipper's in the bedroom, announce Quincet. She'll be flustered, but she'll do it. Then I join Clipper. That safe will pop with a screwdriver. Make sure she extends the guest list that night. The more crowded the room, the better. Daisy, I've never seen you so brilliant. You've given me a basket full of nights to think. tonight. She said she had a cold. Oh, I thought your influence was going to be so constructive. <laughs> I see we have some new guests here tonight, so we'll break them in gently with Percy Shelley's Love's Philosophy. The fountains mingle with the river, and the rivers with the ocean. 
The winds of heaven mix forever with a sweet emotion. Nothing in this world is single. All things by a law divine in one spirit meet and mingle. Why not I with thine? See the mountains kiss the high heaven and the waves clasp one another. No sister flower would be forgiven if it disdained its brother. And the sunlight clasps the earth. And the moonbeams kiss the sea. What is all this sweet work worth if thou kiss not me? And now I'd like to introduce Quincet Desmond, reading Elizabeth Barrett Browning's sonnets from the Portuguese, sonnet number 43. Ronnie, I cannot by following you is a hard task. No. Yes. And now you'll see what a poor reader I really am. <laughs> sonnet number 43. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach. When feeling out of sight for the ends of being an ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I loved with the passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. 